Okay, I think everybody's in for now, so uh, people can just join us as they arrive. Um, welcome back, everybody, to I think this is week five of our Birds of Newfoundland webinar series. Um, I'm excited to have a whole bunch of people here again tonight. Uh, it's really great to see people coming out every week um, so we can talk about the birds we all know and love, and hopefully we can uh, know them a little bit more after tonight. So tonight we will be talking about raptors, kingfishers, and woodpeckers. Um, and Catherine Dale is with me here tonight. Oh, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Jenna McDermott. Um, I'm the assistant coordinator for the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And Catherine Dale is here with me. She'll be monitoring the chat tonight. Um, and she is the coordinator for the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And um, we both work for an organization called Birds Canada. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, we have offices all across Canada, so it's um, quite a large nonprofit. And in addition to the employees that are associated with our organization, we also have a very large amount of volunteers, over 70,000 volunteers um, that were involved in our different programs that we had on just in this past year. So our mission at Birds Canada is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. And to do that, we do uh, run several programs across the country. And a lot of these programs are really citizen science based. And so citizen scientists are just people um, like you or me who are interested in birds in this for this example. Um, and they participate in a program and collect data and add it to our program so that we can use that data to help conserve birds. Um, so right now in Newfoundland, we are having two programs running. The first one is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, which I just mentioned is um, Catherine and mine uh, main job is to run this program. So I'll just give a quick little overview of it tonight. There is a whole webinar near the end of this series that is, um, is just about the, the Breeding Bird Atlas. So you can come to that if you're interested. But basically the intention of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is to map the distribution and abundance of all of the bird species that breed on the island of Newfoundland. So you can see, um, for example, this map on the right there is where all of the bald eagles have been found in potential breeding areas on Newfoundland since we started this program three years ago. Um, so if anybody has any nesting locations of bald eagles, we are very happy to hear about them and you can reach out to us uh, via email or join the atlas and put in that information yourself. Um, and this is just one of the species, of course, that we're interested in. So um, we do, of course, uh, welcome people of any skill level to join the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, um, because even if you only know one species, like this bald eagle, for example, that information is still uh, very important for us. We have another program that we run in Newfoundland right now, um, which is called the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. That will be um, starting up pretty soon, actually, uh, at the in the middle of April, or sorry, the beginning of April. I always get the dates mixed up. <laughs> and basically, this is another citizen science survey where people sign up for a route um, that you run one evening every year in the early spring. You basically go out on roadside counts and see how many bird or how many owls you can hear um, and what species they are. So it's really cool and also a really good entry survey for people who maybe aren't quite as familiar with all of the bird species because we really only have a few different species of owls to know their call. Um, so that's another one you can get in touch with us if you're interested in um, joining the nocturnal owl survey. Um, the lands that we uh, run both of these programs on are the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose people have been erased forever. And additionally, I'd like to acknowledge that the island of Newfoundland is the unceded territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. These people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial. And through the work of the Breeding Bird Atlas, and the Nocturnal Owl Survey, we hope to assist this stewardship in protecting all of the species that we share this island with. 
Um, First Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. And we support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous people to care for the land. If you're interested in learning more about the ancestral lands that you live on or you work on, um, I'd recommend going to the website that I have at the bottom here, nativeland.ca. That's a really good place to start learning about that kind of thing. And just before we get started into the meat of tonight's program, I would just uh, like to quickly thank all of our partners and funders who has um, support helps us run such um, such large and powerful programs in Newfoundland. So thank you to all of them and to all of our volunteers and for you guys for coming out tonight again. Um, as you know, we are going to be talking about um, raptors tonight. So raptors are typically also called birds of prey that um, we can we can group those into separate groups here of diurnal raptors. Diurnal just means active by day. And then we can also, uh, we'll also be talking about owls. Some of the owls in Newfoundland are also active during the day, but I've put them in the owl section for uh, ease of understanding. And most of the diurnal raptors in Newfoundland actually fly uh, fly south or fly a little bit a little bit south at least for the winter, um, except for bald eagles who stick around. And most of the owls are, are residents. They stick around all year. Um, but northern sawwet owls do move around a little bit in the winter, sometimes leaving, coming back later. Um, and the rest of them stick around. So as we go through the slides today, I'll be showing you pictures of adults in breeding plumage. Um, of the birds that breed here specifically. Um, sometimes we have visitors in the winter that aren't breeding, but we're not going to go into those. Um, and males and females typically are looking the same unless I have a picture of a male and a female. And um, I'm also going to just chat a little bit about birding ethics here for a second, um, which is a good topic for, for anybody who's birding, but specifically on a night where we're talking about owls, um, because they are so popular that if sometimes people hear about where an owl is located, um, there will be so many people going to visit it that it um, gets so disturbed by constant human presence that it's not able to undergo its typical uh, daily activities and can really be harmed by that. So um, we always need to think about the bird first when we're going birding or bird watching. Um, give them more space, give any bird more space than you think is necessary, um, just so that you're not disturbing them. Uh, don't use flash photography. Um, again, we're trying to limit disturbance if you're taking pictures. Um, and specifically for owls, uh, well, I guess, I mean, most large nesting birds, we don't want to advertise necessarily the location of nests so that we are not disturbing them at this very important part of their life. Um, and there is sort of a, a code of ethics um, text that's used from most birding organizations, and I'll send that around, a link to that in a follow-up email to this presentation today, if you want to read into it more. Um, just before we get into specific species, for the raptors, a lot of information can be actually gleaned from birds in flight, as well as birds that are perched. Um, we can look at things like their flight style, their body shape and wing shape, um, as well as, of course, the plumage coloration, uh, the colors of their feathers. But sometimes you can only see a silhouette of a bird flying overhead. Um, and these, these are really good clues um, for knowing the species. So those are things you'll become more familiar with as you um, get more familiar with these birds. But so this is another another little sheet that I'll send around as well on a follow-up email. Our first bird of tonight is the osprey. So a lot of people are quite familiar with the osprey. They are a pretty large raptor. You can see that hooked bill, which is pretty typical of raptors um, that they're using for tearing open prey. Osprey are associated with water because they're hunting for fish. So you'll see them flying over water bodies. Um, they'll often pause in flight and sort of 
um, flap, flap their wings and, and hover in one spot before they dive down to catch a fish. Um, Osprey will carry fish a really long distance in order to go eat it themselves or to bring it back to a nest. So they are often nesting near water, but they say they can sometimes nest up to 20 uh, kilometers away from water as well. And they'll go pretty far to, to go find food. So when we're, we're looking at clues for identification, when it's perched, you can see that it's really uh, has a white underbelly. It has a fully brown back. And then it has this patterned face uh, with a with a black stripe that goes behind the eye and um, and a white top and bottom of the head. When it's flying there on the left, you can see that the wings are really long and quite thin. Um, so if you're looking at a silhouette, that's something you'll take note of. And if we're looking at the colors, you'll see they're all white underneath, but uh, they have a dark patch near the quote unquote wrist. Um, which is on all of them. And they're sort of um, barred, I guess, in the, under the wings and tail. Um, Osprey's nests are quite large and um, obvious. If you see them on the landscape, they're often in old dead trees or even use the top of hydro towers and poles to build a nest on. Really cool to see. Here's another familiar bird, the bald eagle. Again, you'll find this one near coastlines and water. Um, they'll also move quite far from a nesting area to find food. They're hunting for fish as well, or for ducks and other waterfowl. Um, but they're also quite good at scavenging. So they'll steal food from gulls or osprey who have already caught something. And the bald eagle will go and bully them to give it to them instead. Um, they are also building giant stick nests in trees. They use these nests year after year. They'll fix them up, add more huge sticks, uh, and the nest just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The largest nest that I found a record of weighed two metric tons, which is the equivalent of eight adult male polar bears. So that's pretty gigantic. <laughs> um, when we're taking a look at what they look like here, um, they're all dark brown all over with a fully white head and a fully white tail, and they have this very large yellow beak um, that's quite prominent. And also, if you look at the tips of the wings, they have pretty prominent fingers, so each of the feathers there, flight feathers, uh, shows separately looking kind of like fingers. You would expect that such a Majestic large bird would sound also majestic and large, but bald eagles actually make a kind of silly noise and I'll show it to you here. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Maybe it's not working. Oh, here we go. It's maybe kind of quiet. But it is a bit of a, a silly noise. So in the movies and stuff, when when they're showing a bald eagle, they're actually often playing the sound of a red-tailed hawk, which is that um, uh, aggressive screech that you associate with with hawks <laughs> instead of the eagle noise. Um, bald eagles, interestingly, um, they're a, a good success, a good conservation success story because in the mid 1900s, their population crashed really hard. Um, when DDT was being used as a pesticide, it um, softened the eggshells so the young wouldn't hatch because they would crack the eggs um, before they were supposed to hatch. And after DDT was panned or was banned, the numbers of bald eagles have actually increased back to levels from before DDT was being used. So it's really um, a good success story. Okay, so here we have. A, a whole bunch of pictures of bald eagles and they all look very different. And that's because it actually takes five years until they get their full adult plumage. So the one on the bottom right, of course, is a full adult, the one that you uh, uh, know know very well. And the, um, the juvenile ones who are less than five years old are gonna be a mix of dark brown and mottled white. Um, so the one on the farthest left would be the youngest they start with a black bill and it turns yellow as time goes on. And they also start with the most white on them and the, the white throughout the body 
turns into dark brown until they have the full dark brown plumage. So the one flying up at the top right is also a bald eagle, it's just a juvenile. Moving on to another bird, this is the Northern Harrier, one of my personal favorites. Um, Northern Harriers are uh, quite a bit smaller than the bald eagle and the osprey, um, but they're sort of mid-sized raptor. Um, if you look at the picture on the top right, you'll notice that they have a bit of an owl-like face. Um, so they have this sort of facial disc and that's because they hunt using um, sound rather than sight. So they're using that facial disc like owls do to funnel sound into their ears. These birds nest actually on the ground um, in fields and marshes. And so you'll see them flying uh, low over marshes and open land in a sort of a buoyant wavery flight that follows the contours of the land. Um, it's really cool to watch them. They hold their wings up in a slight V shape, which is called a dihedral wing position. And um, the two pictures on the bottom here are both the males. Um, they're also known sometimes as the gray ghost. As you can see, they're this sort of misty gray color. On the undersides, they're all white, except for having dark wingtips and dark flight feather edges at the, the, um, the trailing end of the wing. Um, and you'll see that they also have quite a long tail for the size of their body. Um, that's for the males and the females. And if you look at the picture on the bottom right, you'll notice that they have this white patch at the base of the tail, which I'll call the rump patch. And they, so they have this white rump patch and both the males and the females have that as well. And the males are this blue gray above. We'll move on to the females here. They have, of course, the same shape with these long wings, that long tail, but um, the females are brown on, on the top. And they're sort of this, kind of buffy brownish pale color on the bottom, but they again have that white rump um, and they have the same shape of the face that you saw in the, in the male on the other, other slide. Um, juveniles look pretty similar to females. They're brown as well, but underneath they have a bit of an orange wash to them, orangish pink, um, but those can be tricky to tell apart a female and a juvenile. Okay, we'll move on to a grouping of birds called the excipiters. We only have two of them in Newfoundland. The excipiters um, generally have short, wide, rounded wings. So you see the middle silhouette there. They have a long tail that they use as a rudder to help um, change direction as they're flying. And they typically have a flap, flap, flap glide pattern if they're, if they're flying in a straight line. And these birds, the exhibitors, are hunting other birds on the wing. They're pursuing them through the trees and shrubs. So um, the two species we have here, the first is the northern goshawk. The northern goshawk is quite a large bird. It's only a little bit smaller than an osprey. Um, the female is larger than the male, but you wouldn't be able to tell just by sight probably. And uh, the male and female look pretty similar, except for the female has a bit of coarser barring on her, on her breast and belly. So the adults are this stunning slate gray um, all over the back with this pale undersides. Um, and they have a face with um, that uh, has a dark cap and this dark line through the eye. And then they have a bold white eyebrow. Um, that's quite stark in contrast to the rest of the face coloration. And then they also have a long tail, though it's a bit harder to tell um, with the wings folded up like that. If we look at them in flight here, you can see that they look pretty heavy and bulky when they're flying because they are quite a large bird. Um, and rather than having the flat, flat glide uh, that I said exhibitors have generally, and they do have a pretty steady wing beat um, and they're, they're quite a strong flyer. So Northern goshawks in Newfoundland are breeding in thick forests that has some open areas and they're hunting mainly grouse, rabbits and squirrels. Um, they'll be sitting on a perch and then see the animal and um, go chase it from the perch. Um, you can also see on this flying bird that um, they have white on the undertail uh, white feathers on the undertail. Um, and yes, they, they have this fine gray barring, but you can always see that bold white eyebrow. Um, the young birds are mostly brown 
rather than this, this sleek gray color. This is our other exhibitor, the sharp shinned hawk. In contrast, it's a very small bird. It's around the size of a blue jay. Um, and you, if you have a bird feeder out in the winter, you might have seen, or I guess maybe not so much in the winter since they'd be gone, <laughs> um, but you might have seen this bird up around in your yard um, and around towns if you have a bird feeder up. They, um, the adults have this dark uh, slate gray back again, um, and they have a, the, the dark color or the gray color on the head goes all the way down the neck. Um, and melds into the back color. On their belly, they have rusty barring, so they look brown from underneath, or brownish orange. And if you see them when they're flying, um, you'll see that they have their wings sort of pushed forward in a, sort of like they have their shoulders shrugged. Um, and so their head is pressed back into their wings and they have a long tail for the size of their body. Um, females, again, are larger than males, but something you probably wouldn't be able to tell just from looking at one of them on its own. And the sharp shinned hawk is going to be hunting by pursuing birds on the wing. Um, and so, as I said, they're often hanging out by feeders looking for your little birds. Um, yeah, the juveniles of these are, again, browner, and they actually have streaks going down uh, vertically on the body instead of horizontally, like the adults. Okay, the next grouping of birds um, is are the budios, and we actually only have one in Newfoundland. Um, budios, as a grouping, generally have broad wings um, and a short rounded tail, especially compared to the exhibitors we were just looking at. They are often found soaring in wide circles on thermals, um, using the hot air to get higher. And they're hunting from either sitting on perches or by soaring and then uh, diving down. So the one that we have in Newfoundland is called the rough-legged hawk. And uh, this bird is found in open habitat like tundra and marshes, and it actually nests on the edges of cliffs. So Newfoundland is actually the farthest south uh, area of its range. It's found throughout the rest of the Arctic. And because of that, it has a really small bill, really fluffy plumage and small feet that are all adaptations to staying warm in Arctic life. When they're hunting, you'll see them hovering like an osprey would. Um, and so they're hunting for small mammals. They have pretty floppy wing beats and they also hold their wings when they're flying in a slight V or dihedral. If we uh, take a look at them, Oh, and I'll just um, draw your attention to their small bill there. It looks almost like a little pigeon or something, the way their bill is so tiny. Um, if you take a look at their legs, this is why they're called the rough-legged hawk, because you can see the feathers go all the way down to the foot. With most, most raptors have bare legs. Um, they might have some fluffy feathers from up above that are covering the bottom, but they don't have these uh, short feathers that are covering, covering the full leg like the rough-legged hawk. Um, rough-legged hawks come in two different color morphs, a, a light and a dark morph. Morph is not really a great word, even though it's often used because it sort of implies that they can change their color through their lifetime, but they don't do that. They stay either light or dark um, through their whole lifetime. So this is the light morph. They have, oh, it's a bit hard to see actually in this picture on the top left. They have a white rump, like we talked about with the Northern Harrier um, that you can see when they're flying from above. And if you look at the picture on the bottom of it flying, you'll see that they have uh, white under their wings, but they have these black wrist patches like we saw in the Osprey. And then we also have dark tips on the, on the wing feathers. Um, the, the light morph will have a dark band across the belly um, but it will be pale above and below on the on the head and uh, near the tail. Um, okay, so then we move on to the dark morph here. So the dark morph is dark all over, dark brown. It doesn't have the white rump, it has a black rump patch. Um, 
It still has those black patches on the wrist, but you'll see that the rest of the underside of the wing is dark um, up near the top. And they still have white flight feathers, so that white band through the wing with uh, dark tips on all of them. And again, they're, they're, they're dark all underneath, and they also have a black band on the tail. But those are all versions of rough-legged hawk. We'll move in now to the falcons. The falcons as a grouping have long pointed wings, um, pointed being the key here. They have long tails again, and they're fast flyers with really strong wing beats. Um, they're typically hunting by capturing their prey midair or on the ground. And they're often starting from a perch, watching something and then diving on it. Um, although some do catch their prey on the wing and I'll talk about those ones. All of these birds uh, migrate away for the winter. The first one I'll talk about is the American kestrel. It's our smallest falcon. It's actually really tiny. Um, it's smaller than a robin or around the same size, quite small. Um, the kestrel nests in cavities in open habitats, uh, tree cavities in open habitats. And if they're sitting somewhere, uh, you might see them bobbing their tail up and down, which is pretty cute. Um, this is, these are, this is, these pictures are both adults, the males on the left, the females on the right. You can see if you focus on their face that they have two very, um, distinct bars going down the face, these black bars. Um, the male on the left has this vibrant rusty colored back and tail with, um, blue gray wings, whereas the female is a bit paler and her wings are the same color as, uh, her back and they both have a pale belly with little spots on it. When they're flying, you can really see the long pointed wings, the pointed wings that I mentioned go with all of the, um, all of the falcons and the long tail. So these birds are also going to sort of stall in the air and hover when they're hunting. Um, kestrels are really cute because they eat dragonflies. They catch them while they're flying and they eat them while they're flying. Um, and if you take a look at the bird on the left, that's a male again, and you can see there's a bold black bar on the bottom of the tail um, that you can see while flying. And uh, um, in both those pictures of the flying birds, you can also see when they're a bit backlit that they have these little white windows showing at the base of the uh, wing feathers. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and that's a, that's a key mark for kestrels when they're flying. This is our next falcon, the merlin. Um, they can look similar to kestrels when they're backlit, but they are quite a bit, uh, well, not quite a bit. They're a little bit bigger than a kestrel. But when we're looking at the difference between these two when they're flying, the flight style is really important. And that's something that um, as you see more of both of them, you'll you'll get to uh, get a handle on it. But the merlin has really powerful wing beads, so it has a straight, determined flight with intention to get somewhere. You can see it's going somewhere for a reason, whereas a kestrel is sort of fluttering around a little bit more. You can tell that it's a smaller bird while they're flying. They're also, uh, the merlin is also pursuing um, its prey on the wing while it's hunting, and it's hunting small birds and dragonflies as well. Overall, you can see that the Merlin has a dark appearance. They have a streaked body and a barred, um, barred underwing and tail. So you can see the, the bars on the wing and tail on the flying picture. And they do have a bit of a weak sort of mustache coming down from the face and a white throat. When they're perching, their wingtips are shorter than their tail. That's something you can pay attention to. Um, and Merlins are living in open tree habitats, but you'll also find these in towns as well. So um, if there's some wooded areas near your town or in your town, you could find a Merlin. Our final falcon is the peregrine falcon. Um, this is a pretty cool bird, cool looking, <laughs> cool acting. Um, it's the largest falcon that we have, and as you can see, their face pattern is a bit different. They have this really bold, dark mustache on the on the face. This this dark patch going down from the eye. Um, the adults are slate gray on their back and wings, 
and underneath they have dark um, the sort of black and white barring. Um, the wings meet the tail when they're perching, so they go all the way to the bottom of the tail. And again, look at those long, sharp wings, those really pointed triangle wings when they're flying. Um, the peregrine falcon is a hunter that is um, uh, diving onto its prey from, from flight, and they sort of dive like a fighter jet onto other birds that they're hunting. Um, they're really just pure power when they're flying, and they can reach speeds of 100 meters per second when they're stooping or diving onto their prey. Peregrine falcons um, are not super common in Newfoundland, but they do nest in a few different areas. They're nesting on cliffs, and, um, and they can be quite territorial in their nesting areas. This is another bird that declined a lot with the use of DDT, that same uh, pesticide that I was talking about with the bald eagle. They were declining in the 50s to 70s, but a, the, they have also rebounded successfully after DDT was banned. Okay, moving on now to the owls. So most people are familiar with the general idea of an owl or uh, identifying an owl as a grouping. They have these round facial discs that they use to funnel sound into their ears. Um, they fly silently um, because they have special feather structures that help dissipate the sound. And females are typically larger than males, but again, this is something hard to tell if you only have one individual. Um, most owls are, well, owls are typically thought of as um, being active during the night, but we do have a couple that are active during the day including this first one, the short-eared owl. Um, short-eared owls are found in open country and wetlands. You'll find them along the tundra uh, and other open areas of Newfoundland. And they're cruising low over these habitats, um, sort of like the Northern Harrier that I talked about earlier. They're also going to nest on the ground. Um, and when you're identifying them, um, you might think that the short ears would be a good marker, but as you can see on the picture on the far left, those short ear tufts are really tiny and they are often not visible at all. So <laughs> um, it's not really a useful mark uh, for identifying them. But they are, um, the, the adults are a dark, um, sorry, a brown and white sort of streaking. Um, the females are darker than the males typically. And if you look at their face coloration, you'll see they have these brilliant yellow eyes, but they have these really dark smudges around the eyes. I like to think of it as kind of like 90s grunge eye makeup. It's like really dark eyes. Um, and so that's a good mark for them. When they're flying, you'll notice that they do not have a white rump patch at the base of the tail. And you'll see at the underside of the wings that they have uh, white under the wings, but they have these two dark bars um, near the tip of the wings, one at the wrist and one at the tip of the wings. We'll just take a second to compare the short-eared owl and the northern harrier because they are often found in the same habitat and they hunt in a similar fashion in this, um, this flight that's sort of wavering close to the ground. So we have the short-eared owl on the left and uh, we'll compare where the dark patches are on the wings. So you, you can see the two bars on the short-eared owl's wing, whereas the Northern Harrier has black tips on the wing of the male and is brown in the female. Then we also will look at the tail. You can see the short-eared owl has really quite a short tail for the size of its body, whereas the Northern Harrier's tail is quite long. And also look for that white rump patch. Northern Harrier, both males and females have a white patch on the rump. Um, and short eared owls have none. This is um, the great horned owl, one that many people are familiar with. It's a pretty large, bulky owl. It is a nocturnal owl. Did I mention that the short eared owl was diurnal? You could see it hunting in the daytime. If I didn't, it does. <laughs> uh, the great horned owl hunts in the nighttime, so we're often going to hear it more than see it. Um, because it will be found sleeping in the trees, roosting in the trees uh, during the daytime. It hunts at forest edges at night. Um, so this is again, a pretty bulky bird. It has long ear tufts that are unmistakable um, if you can see it. And it has sort of this mottled brown and rusty brown 
body with dark barring on its belly. I'll just let you listen to it for a second since you might often hear this rather than see it. So this is the great horned owl call. <coughs> a pretty owly, typical owl kind of call when you think of an owl. This next bird is the Northern Hawk Owl. Um, it's quite a bit more rare in Newfoundland. Um, the Northern Hawk Owl is found in definitely more remote areas, whereas the Great Horned Owl can be found kind of near towns, sort of at the edges of towns. Um, but Northern Hawk Owls are kind of hard to find. They are also active during the day. So you could see them out hunting during the day. Um, they're quite a bit smaller. They're around probably the size of a mm, bit bigger than like a gray jay or Canada jay. They have a long pointed tail, um, a rounded head that looks kind of like it's just sitting squat on its shoulders, yellow eyes and um, yellow bill. And it has a pale gray face with these really uh, stark black frame around it. Um, if we look at the color of the belly and breast, it's got horizontal brown barring on it. And if we look at the back, we can see that it's dark brown with white spots. And the top of the head also has spots on the forehead and the crown. So the northern hawk owl is living in the boreal forest, usually near openings like bogs or uh, old or old burns um, or cut blocks that uh, harvested area. So again, you'll have to definitely get out of town to, to see a northern hawk owl. They're not really a typical owl sound. So I'll play them for you just so you get an idea of the range of voices that owls can have. So it's really quite different um, than what you would expect an owl to sound like. This is the cutest little owl, the northern sawwet owl. It's really quite tiny, just like um, a little handful. Um, they're basically all head and body. They have this really large head for their body, bright yellow eyes. Um, their facial disc is sort of a pale brownish buffy color. And they're brown on the back with brown, broad brown streaking on the belly. If we take a look at the face of face again, you'll see that there's no black border around the facial disc. The color of the facial disc sort of blends into the color of the back of the head. You'll also notice that they have a white V or Y at the front of the face that goes over the eyes and down to the beak. And they have stripes on their forehead. This bird um, is also nocturnal, so it's hunting during the night and roosting during the day. You can find them also near the edges of towns, um, but also out in more wild areas. And they are definitely using treed foresty areas. Um, I'll let you listen to this bird as well because um, it also doesn't sound like a typical owl. Um, I think that that sort of beeping sound, they will go on with that for like minutes and minutes at a time. And I think it sounds like a truck backing up. Um, so that's the Northern Solvent Owl. A very similar looking species is the Boreal Owl. The Boreal Owl is also a very tiny owl, just a little handful of a thing. Um, it has basically the same shape and a lot of the same coloration, but it has sort of a different uh, pattern of streaking on the belly. It's kind of brown and white spots and streaks rather than just streaking. And if we take a look at the face, you'll notice that um, it has a black frame around the face, but is broken with white spots. So it's a black frame that's broken up. Um, on its back, it's brown and it has white spots and it also has spots on its forehead. This is another bird that is nocturnal. Um, so it's hunting at night and it's roosting during the day. And it really loves to be deep in the boreal forest. And boreal owls are actually quite, uh, seem to be quite uncommon in Newfoundland now. Um, and that's happened in, in recent years, it seems like. Um, just as northern sawwet owls have not been found on the island of Newfoundland before, they are sort of everywhere now. And boreal owls have definitely uh, seemed to disappear a little bit. Um, I'll also play the boreal owl because I know Catherine mentioned 
that it sounds very similar to the Wilson Snipe that she played for you last week if you were here then. So take a listen to this. Um, so if you hear that in the nighttime, oh, I'm trying to play it again, but maybe it's not working. It's not working. Anyway, so it sounds very similar to Wilson's name, but Boreal Owl only makes this call when it's sitting still on a branch, not when it's flying. So we'll take a second to compare the last three owls that we had um, because they're all our little teeny owls. Um, when we're comparing them, if you see them, you are looking at the color of the frame of the face. So the Sawit has uh, no black frame. It blends the color into the head the boreal owl has a dark frame around the face, but it's uh, that's rounded, but it's broken up by white spots. And the northern hawk owl has a really bold black pattern that's not broken up at all. Um, we'll also look at the striping or spotting on the forehead, which is not really the best marker for me, I think personally, but others may find it more useful. Um, and then we can also look at the patterning on the breast and belly. So the sawwet has vertical stripes sort of broad stripes going down. The boreal owl has vertical stripes or spots. So it's definitely more spotted looking. Um, and the northern hawk owl has horizontal, really fine barring um, and also a long pointed tail. Um, again, an important thing to look at for these is behavior. The northern hawk owl is active during the day, whereas the sawwet and the boreal are active during the night. And that is all of our raptors. So we'll move on to our one and only kingfisher that we have in Newfoundland, which is the belted kingfisher. Um, and this is a pretty unmistakable bird. Um, they are going to be found near water, hovering over water and diving in to catch fish. Um, they have this really long, strong pointed bill and they have a shaggy crest that you can see when it's raised up on the picture on the right. And when they smooth it down, if they're relaxed, um, then it'll look like a picture on the left. The males and females look similar, but as you can see, the female who is on the right has a extra um, band on her belly, a chestnut brown band, whereas the male has just the one um, blue gray band at the top and no chestnut brown but both the male and female are blue gray above with a dark head and white below. When they're flying, um, you can see sometimes this white wing patch that the, the, light, the light shows through near the tip of the wing, which is really cool. And I will also let you listen to their call because you might've heard them even if you haven't seen them. It's quite a distinctive call. So if you live near the water or have a cabin near the water, you might hear them uh, going by if they're nesting in the area. Okay, we'll move on to the woodpeckers now. We have several species of woodpeckers in Newfoundland. Um, some are definitely more common than others. And we'll go through all of these ones in the next several minutes. So woodpeckers are a pretty well-known family. Uh, people can identify that it's a woodpecker usually based on the shape of their bill, this chisel-like bill, um, how they climb up and down tree trunks using their stiff tail feathers to hold them up. Um, and they're sort of always pecking at the tree trunk to get insects out. The males of each species, uh, males and females typically look nearly the same except for males usually have an extra patch of color um, so all of the ones I've shown here are the males of these species, and they excavate cavities uh, where they nest and roost. So the first I'll talk about is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's not super common in Newfoundland, but it is seen yearly around the island, and it's breeding in mixed woodlands, um, so that's mixed deciduous and coniferous trees. They um, leave during the winter, so they're only around in the summertime. And both the males and the females have a red cap on the top of their head, but only the male has a red throat, which you can see on the left. Um, they're called the yellow-bellied sapsucker because they do have this pale yellowish, yellowish wash on their belly, uh, which is otherwise quite white, but it's pretty hard to see actually in real life. Um, so it's not the best name to go by, but here we are. <laughs> um, the best marker for the yellow-bellied sapsucker, other than the coloration on the head, 
is this really prominent white bar that goes all the way down the side of the wing. None of our other Newfoundland woodpeckers have that wing bar. Um, you'll also notice that they have a unbroken white stripe that goes from above the bill all the way down the side of the head and neck and down into the chest. Um, so that's a good mark for them as well. And um, am I missing anything on them here? They have some white along the back um, as well. So they have black wings, but they do have some white along the back. Yellow belly sap suckers are really cool because they're actually, um, they actually drink sap. So this picture is of um, different, uh, they call them wells that, that they'll peck into a tree. So they'll peck these little wells into the tree so that the sap will run out and they'll come back later and drink the sap and eat the insects that have gotten stuck into the sap. Um, so it's really a cool feeding behavior that they have. Our next woodpecker is the downy woodpecker. It's the smallest woodpecker that we have in Newfoundland. Um, it's basically black and white, except for the male who has a little red spot on the back of the head. Um, if you take a look at their bill, it's a short bill. If you um, turn to the bill back onto the head, it would be um, less than half of the head long, uh, which is a good mark for them. And they have, of course, um, a white belly, black on the back, and also a white patch on the back as well. And then they have black, uh, black wings with white spots on them. The female on the right, as you can see, doesn't have any red on her head. And these birds are actually small enough that they can forage on little tiny branches and even little stalks of weeds and uh, flowers and stuff like that. Uh, that's how small they are. Downy woodpeckers are pretty common in treed areas around Newfoundland, and they're also found within towns and parks as well. So they'll come out, out to your feeder or you might see them in your yard in town. Here we have the hairy woodpecker, which looks basically the exact same except for that it is significantly larger than the downy woodpecker. Um, again, that's difficult to tell if you don't have them side by side, but one thing to look at is the length of the bill. So um, the hairy wood woodpecker has a long bill compared to the size um, of its head. And I'll show you on the next, uh, the next slide, a bit of a comparison. Again, the male has a red spot on the back of the head that the female doesn't have, and they're white on the belly and black on the wings. Uh, with a white patch on the back and white spots on the wings as well. So this is just a comparison of the downy versus hairy woodpecker. The downy woodpecker is on the top, hairy woodpecker is on the bottom. And when we're looking at the difference between these two, we're really comparing the size of the bill relative to the size of their own head. So the downy woodpecker down in the bottom is A. Um, you can see that its bill is small. It's less than half the size of the head if you turned it backwards. Whereas the hairy woodpecker has a large bill, it's more than half of the length of the head if you turned it backward. So that's a really important cue if you're trying to tell these two species apart. Um, this is the American three-toed woodpecker. It's definitely less common in Newfoundland. They're not going to be usually found in towns uh, or probably in your yard. Um, they're more found in, um, old growth boreal forest, especially in burned areas. Um, they're actually going to be feeding not by pecking holes in the tree necessarily, but by flaking bark off to find beetles that are hiding underneath. Um, again, they're black and white um, with white barring on the back, black wings, and the males have a yellow patch on the crown rather than the red that we saw before, and the females have no color on the crown at all. Um, their name tells this little piece of info, which is that they actually only have three toes. Most woodpeckers actually have four. Um, so this American three-toed woodpecker and this one, the blackback woodpecker, are the only two that have only three toes instead of four. Um, the blackback woodpecker here looks pretty similar to the American three-toed. Um, what we're looking for to compare them is the fact that the black backed woodpecker has a really glossy black back. It has no white on the back at all. Um, again, the male has yellow on the top of his head. The female does not. And you can see that they're white underneath. They have black barring on the side. And um, they 
have this really uh, distinct white pattern going down the side of the face. I'll just bring back up a picture of the American three-toed woodpecker to compare the where the white is on the face. Um, so just take a look at how um, how distinct it is on the black-backed woodpecker compared to the three-toed woodpecker that I just brought back up. This is our last woodpecker, um, actually our last bird for the night, the northern flicker. Um, this bird is so brightly colored, it almost looks like it should be living in the tropics. When I first saw the <laughs> northern flicker, I thought I'd found like a crazy rarity or something before I figured out what it was. Northern flickers do live in Newfoundland and they're quite um, widespread through the island. They are found in open habitat, but with trees nearby and they also nest in cavities that they build in the trees. Um, as you can see, there are only woodpecker that's brown instead of black and white. So the males and females look um, the same, except for that the males have a black stripe from the bottom of the bill and the female has no black stripe, which you can see uh, in the flying picture on the bottom right there. When they're perched, you'll notice that they have these cute black spots everywhere on their belly, like someone painted them with a little paintbrush. They have a black band along the chest and they have a red stripe on the back of the head, which is present on the male and the female. If you see um, the top of them when they're flying, you'll see that they have a white rump. Um, and if you see under their wing when they're flying, you'll see they have a bright, brilliant yellow underwing and under their tail. Uh, which is really cool to see. Um, Northern flickers sometimes confuse people a lot um, and they don't necessarily think that they're woodpeckers because they often feed on the ground. They really like ants. So they'll often be like hopping around on the lawn, um, eating insects from the ground rather than um, going up and down tree trunks like the rest of the woodpeckers that we're familiar with. Okay, so that's all of our birds, we're going to go into a little um, skill testing section. <laughs> um, there's, I think, eight. So if anybody has to leave, I'm not sure what time it is. Oh, we should have enough time. But if anyone has to leave, of course, uh, you can pop out whenever you want to. But we'll start with the first one here. Um, let me bring up the poll. And who do you think this species is? If the poll window is in the way, you can always uh, click and drag it around your screen so you can see the bird. Okay. So we have three choices, peregrine falcon, merlin, and sharp-shinned hawk. I'll just leave it open a couple more seconds. Okie dokie, I'm gonna close it up. So 56% uh, of people thought this was a Merlin and that is correct. Oh, can I, yep, okay, that showed up. Um, so this is a Merlin. Um, we know that it's a Merlin because it is most like a pretty dark bird, generally dark brown. Peregrine falcon would be sort of a slate grayish blue um, with a really distinct um, mustache stripe as opposed to this sort of um, less distinct one that's on the Merlin here. And a sharp shinned hawk would be um, also slate gray along the back and um, um, definitely paler on the underside and wouldn't have that uh, mustache stripe at all. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Who is this bird? Can you see that poll? Maybe not. I did something wrong. Just a second. <laughs> I don't know why these polls are always so hard. Okay, that should be showing now. Who do you think this bird is? Hmm. 
just give it a few more seconds for last second answers here. Okay, I'll close it up. So um, most people thought, well, this is a pretty tricky one, it looks like. So we have a lot of people with rough-legged hawk and also bald eagle. This is a rough-legged hawk. Um, this is the dark morph rough-legged hawk. And you can see it's got that really teeny tiny little bill that I talked about um, since it's from the Arctic. It's got to keep warm. Um, the bald eagle immature would have, even when it's immature, it would still have um, white feathers throughout uh, the breast and belly and along the back as well, um, as opposed to being this fully dark brown, um, dark brown color we see here. The northern harrier is um, a pretty good guess as well for the female um, because she's brown, um, but she's also pale underneath the bottom instead of brown on the bottom. Um, and she would have quite a bit longer of a tail. Okay. I think I don't know how to do polls today, but let's try this. Okay, here's our next bird. <laughs> um, okay, that should show up. Who do you think this is? We have our four black and white woodpecker species as options. Just leave it a couple more seconds here. Okay, I'll close this up. So this is a um, so I'm struggling with my slides here. <laughs> this is a hairy woodpecker. Um, so 69% uh, of you got that right. Um, the uh, red on the head there means that it's a male and that also eliminates the American three-toed woodpecker and the black-backed woodpecker because they should have either no color on the head or yellow if it's a female or if it's a male, sorry. So that leaves uh, downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker. And for them, again, we're really comparing the size of the bill to the size of its own head. So you can see this uh, hairy woodpecker, if you turn the bill back on the head, it's more than half the size of the head. Whereas the downy woodpecker would have a little teeny bill. Very good. On to the next. Um, who is this bird? I'm always impressed how much people can remember after such a packed full of webinar. I'll close this one up in a second. Okay. Um, so this is in fact a Northern Harrier. Well done everyone uh, who had that one right. Um, this is a female because she's brown all over. If you look carefully at the base of the tail, you'll see the white rump patch, which means that it can't be a short-eared owl. Uh, short-eared owl would also have white under the wings, except for having two uh, black bars, one at the wrist, uh, quote unquote wrist, and one at the tip of the tip of the wings. Um, and the rough-legged hawk, um, it uh, if it was a dark morph, it would uh, be much darker brown and also have uh, really uh, pale edges of the wings. Um, and if it was a light morph one, it would have, um, you would see very prominent sort of that black wrist patch that we talked about. Okay, on to the next one. Oh, I didn't do that right again. Okay, <laughs> here's the next one. <laughs>
Okay. Oh, we still got some answers coming in. I'll close this one up in a second. Okay. So uh, nobody said rough legged hawk, so that's good since this is an osprey, um, which most of you got right. Well done. The peregrine falcon um, does have this pale underneath it, but it doesn't have quite that dark section that goes all the way down the neck. It would just have a dark patch on the face. Um, and it also wouldn't have all of that uh, dark patterning under the wings in the, in the same way as the osprey. Okay, good job. Uh, we have just a couple more here. Here's our next one. I think there's this and two others, if I'm remembering correctly. Here we have our woodpeckers again. <laughs> oh, and that should say downy woodpecker, not down woodpecker. I'll just leave it open a few more seconds. Okie dokie, I'll close this up. Um, okay, so we have a pretty even split here between um, American three-toed woodpecker and blackback woodpecker. And this is a American three-toed woodpecker. Um, the uh, American three-toed woodpecker um, has that sort of white uh, white barring on the back, whereas the blackback woodpecker would be fully uh, slate black on the back. Um, the downy woodpecker, um, doesn't have quite that amount of um, barring on the side and also has a bit of a different face pattern with the white, uh, the white and black on the face compared to this guy. Okay, uh, next one here. We have a cute little guy here. Who is this? I gave you the three tricky options. I'll close it in just a second here. We have most people in already. Okay, I'll close this up. So most people thought this was a Northern Sawwet Owl and that is correct. Oh, did I change things? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, this is a Northern Sawwet Owl. Um, when we look at these three species, um, we'll again be looking at the pattern around the face. So the northern saw white owl has the color sort of blends into the color of the back of the head, whereas the boreal owl and the northern hawk owl would both have a black border around uh, the face, with the boreal owl having also some white spots in the black border. Very good. Um, and this is our final one here. And who is this bird? The answers are coming in thick and fast. <laughs> so I'll only leave it open for a couple more seconds. All right, here we go. 99% of people said a bald eagle, and that is correct. Um, well done, everybody. A northern goshawk, uh, goshawk would be um, would be sort of slate gray all over uh, without that distinct white color of the head. Um, and so we started with the bald eagle and we'll end with the bald eagle today. Um, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure. Um, let me know if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask them or put them in the chat. Um, I will be sending out a follow up email with uh, some of those resources I mentioned earlier, as well as a recording of tonight's webinar so you can watch it again if you want to or share it with people. 
Um, if you have any questions about any of our programs, feel free to reach out to us by email um, or check out our social media uh, or our website. And we're always happy to hear from, from other people who love birds. So thanks everybody and uh, have a great evening. Unless there's any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. Uh, mostly just lots and lots of thanks in the chat. Um, people remarking that your quiz was uh, was tough. Um, and was, yeah. okay, I am going back through the <laughs> uh, the questions here. Um, okay, so um, okay, Ellie is saying that uh, you mentioned that sharpies aren't common here in the winter; that they go south. But there have been a lot of pictures of them recently on the NL Bird Watching Group. Um, is this an unusual year? And the answer is actually, I, I double checked their range. Um, so some of Newfoundland, they are actually year round residents. Um, not all of it by any means, but yes, I've also heard people uh, mentioning Sharpies at their feeder. So yeah, if there's something snatching the birds from around your feeder, that that would like yep. to be a Sharpie. That's the one, yep. <laughs> or, <laughs> sharp to the book. Um, uh, sharp to talk, sorry. Uh, back through these. Um, uh, Keith asked if woodpeckers in general prefer conifers. Um, you're breaking up a little, Catherine, but I assume that the rest of that question was if they prefer conifers or deciduous trees. And you got it. Um, I think that they would use either, although American free toed woodpecker and blackback woodpecker are definitely more coniferous tree species. They're really often like uh, the spruce bogs or like those burnt areas and stuff like that. Um, but the downy and hairy woodpecker as well as the northern flicker would definitely use either one um, and be quite happy, I think, with both. Excellent, thank you. Um, and uh, there was a, I think I've got the more recent questions or at least most of them, <laughs> um, but there was a discussion earlier of whether woodpeckers help or hurt trees um, have thoughts on that do you want to expand i answered a little bit in the chat but yeah i don't think that woodpeckers hurt trees um from what i've read about using cavities and stuff like that they're often um in either already dead trees or dying trees so they're not like creating holes that are that are harming a like a living healthy tree um so I mean, and I mean, they're taking pests away from trees as well uh, if they're eating insects. So I don't think they're hurting, but I mean, they all just live together in the ecosystem like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the question was more in reference to feeding. And uh, I, I think, think the answer is a little bit of both actually, because although generally they don't harm trees and they do actually often find themselves in dead or dying trees, they can, um, they can let in disease simply by you know, breaching the bark of a tree. And also if they fully encircle the stem of a tree, they actually can girdle it and cut off the flow of sap. So that's not great either. But yes, usually there are no parts. harm. <laughs> yeah. Usually there are no harm to, uh, to trees. And mm -hmm. really most people who get frustrated with woodpeckers are when the woodpeckers are poking holes in their house instead of the trees. That's true, yeah. <laughs> And yes, Maryland's uh, sap suckers are actually the most likely to do damage because they drill those those lines of of mm -hmm. holes and they can girdle mm -hmm. trees. Yeah. Okay, is that all of the questions then? Oh, maybe you're frozen again. Am I? No, you weren't. You weren't frozen after all. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the okay. questions. Although Amira has asked uh, if we saw a story about 700 pounds of acorns in a house. Uh, no, but I've seen acorn woodpeckers and I believe it. They're pretty determined little guys. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have them here though. <laughs> no, no. So don't worry about that. Um, why was the snowy owl not included? David has asked. Jenna, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah. Um, the snowy owls can be found in Newfoundland, but they aren't um, they aren't known to or expected to breed in Newfoundland. Uh, they will breed in Labrador, so I didn't include them today uh, just because they don't breed on the island. But yes, you can see snowy owls in the winter time sometimes or uh, in early spring or late fall as they're moving around. Um, and they sort of look different than all of the other owls, so <laughs> at least they're easy to tell apart. 
They do. Big white owl, snowy owl. Yep. Uh, and yes, David, that's right. We're really focused just on the birds that breed on the island to try and keep this to a manageable level. Yes. <laughs> it's already a lot of information, so we wanted to limit it somehow. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. So Jenna, thank you very much for an excellent presentation as always. And uh, we hope to see some of you guys out next week when I believe we are talking about warblers, which are my personal Ooh, favorite. Fun. Yes. Okay, thanks everyone for coming out. See you next week, hopefully.